the check the letter was opened and retaped shut. Oh. Yeah, so, I have not received anything, have not heard from anyone since okay. late end of March. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, a tracking number next time it is mailed? Yeah, I have, um, well, I mean, I can, obviously, I mean, I can send it with some sort of a tracking, um, you know, I mean, type of, you know, delivery, I mean, I can send it certified. I'm Janet Decay, the Mummy. And I'm Grimgory, the Monkey. And together we host The, the Mummy and, and the Monkey's Hairy Scary Hangout! Friday nights on Facebook Live. Well, that was interesting. Whoa. Wow. Hi guys, Janet here from the Mummy and the Monkey YouTube channel. I am a horror film hostess. And my husband and I also sell on eBay. We're also artists. We put together videos for YouTube and for Facebook live streaming. And this video, I'm out of character and it's talking more about behind the scenes and I wanted to tell you uh, a story. It's story time with Janet um, about what it was like to put together and uh, get a, uh, an actual brick and mortar, a physical store going and open up my own business and what it was like running the store. Um, so I wanted to go into a lot of details about that and I've had some fans and friends say that I should do a video about this and it's something I've always wanted to do but I wanted to wait until um, the lease was up and everything was kind of done. You know when I was I was kind of done with that. So I had to wait a little while and uh, so I guess we'll, we'll as some YouTubers say, let's dive right in. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Janet, and I, for a long time, worked a regular day job. So uh, I remember being like 16, 17, you know, 18, knowing that I loved art, I loved working on art, I just didn't know what I wanted to do with myself as an adult, and grew up poor. You know, uh, mom didn't have money to support us and give us money for college. So after we were like 18 and graduated high school, it was like, okay, you're on your own. And I, a lot of people are in that same boat where they work towards a scholarship, they apply for grants, they just work their way through it, get a loan, whatever they need to do. So I did attend some college. I worked in retail. I had a lot of different day jobs, but my main day job all throughout my 20s was I was a manager for a major retail big box store. I was a department manager and I worked in many different departments. So pet department, um, health and beauty for a few years, the electronics department for a couple of years, and I would do inventory, I would scan items, you know, price changes, I would stock shelves. Pretty much a department manager was a glorified stockman who did the jobs of like three and four different people. If you had people working under you and helping you, you were actually very lucky because most of the time they just had you do everything. And with big business, that's usually how it works. How much work can we get done with the least amount of people, the least amount of overhead, you know, and as, um, you know, and that's just how a lot of businesses are. That's that's just, and that's how they stay in business. <laughs> Unfortunately, is uh, they they uh, just want to get as much work out of one person as as you can. They want to work your butt off. Um, so I did that. You know, it paid the bills. I I had a house. I had a roof over my head, and you know, it was okay. You know, I I would pursue other jobs like um, acting and modeling. And I would go to different uh, conventions and events that were more artsy or more like Halloween or horror film related. Uh, and I would, I would have fun on the weekends or try to plan things in advance. And I would still have my, my regular um, retail day job. So I did that for 10 years. And I left that job 
uh, six years ago and then for almost three years I worked in the automotive industry. I worked for two different car dealerships and for one dealership I worked in internet sales. I would follow up with people's questions from the internet or if they called with questions. If they needed to know the specs on certain car models, I would send over everything to them. I would send over like virtual brochures, I would email. And part of the requirement was you had to make 100 phone calls a day. They wanted you to do, to do 100 phone calls a day. And pretty much they wanted you to pester people to try to get them into the dealership to um, test out a car, to test drive a car, and, and hopefully buy a car. And if you did bring people in, you would get commission. If they bought a car, you got a little bit extra commission and they had a different scale on, on what you would get paid. But that, that was actually, even though you were nonstop pestering people on the phone and working like sometimes 60 hours a week, it was good pay. It was pretty decent. Um, another car dealership job I had was, and I, and I switched, only switched to this job because at the time it was closer to home and less driving for me because... Um, at, at the previous job, they moved office locations and they, they were under like renovating. And I remember at the time I was driving like two hours every day to go back and forth to work. And it was just getting to be too much. I don't like driving that much. And um, yeah, I took this other job at a dealership being a service advisor. And I was told a service advisor is like customer service related and you get to talk with the mechanics and you work together to get the person's car fixed or get their oil changed or you do the, the recalls. Um, and that was extremely like, whoa, that, that was very stressful and a very toxic environment. A lot of the, the people I worked with were always at each other's throats. They were always talking about each other, like rumors going around. I mean, this was worse than working in a regular office the way um, the guys there would spread rumors, they gossiped more than the women. Like, a lot of these dudes were just nasty. <laughs> but I think it's just that industry. A lot of people there seemed really, like, unhappy. And it seemed like if they were frustrated, they would just take your frustrations out on you. And I would get chewed out by customers as well. Uh, the managers weren't very supportive at all. I would get yelled at by customers and, and you go to a manager to ask them something or to ask for backup and they, they don't even want to be near you. Like they don't want to be around. It's like you're stuck handling it. So I left that place after I had everything set up for the shop. So I was watching YouTube videos on reselling and I, I don't know what made me look up videos on reselling but I stumbled upon these two ladies, and I don't remember their names, but they were going out to yard sales. And I just thought that was really interesting that there were people going to yard sales. And they videoed it. Like, I never thought of videoing that. And this was about 2016, so I was still working in, at the automotive job. But looking into other options, I was putting in applications to other places. Um, and, <laughs> let's see... Um, upon finding the, the reseller videos and the garage sale videos, I stumbled upon um, a YouTube account called Craigslist Hunter, and his real name is Pete. He runs a shop in the Chicago area. Craigslist Hunter had some really great information on setting up a store and running a business, and he had a lot of cool info. And once I started watching things like that, and, and I was trying to look into other options on what I could do how to earn a living, how to um, get into a job that's more enjoyable and less stressful for me. But I'll, I'll get into the other stress later. Um, I just thought it was really inspiring. So I want to thank Pete, the Craigslist Hunter, um, Golden Finger Picker, Ronnie Hart, and any of the other YouTubers I may have stumbled upon and um, forgot their names or forgot to mention. Um, because I thought, well, if they can do it, maybe there's hope for me. And I was looking into how to open a business, um, what, what permits I would need uh, in the state of Ohio. And let's see. 
oh, how much I would need. So I was trying to sock away some money to save some money to even start a business because there's that saying that it takes money to make money. Well, it, it, it's partially true. I think it's true. Um, and let's see. Okay, so I was looking at, because I thought, well, I, I have a love of thrifting. I love going to the flea market with my husband. <laughs> I love going out. Um, I love reselling, but at the time I wasn't reselling full-time. So I was a collector for many years. I uh, collect movie memorabilia. I, I, for a long time I collected uh, figurines, anime stuff, video game stuff. Um, autographs. I still collect autographs sometimes, depending on who the actor is and, you know, who they are. Um, but lately I've thinned out my collections a lot, like the past two years. So I thought, you know, and I would sell a few things I, here on eBay, like here and there. So, like, let's say if I have a collection, sometimes I would put some stuff on eBay to sell it just to get some spending money to go buy more crap I didn't need or to maybe go to a convention to get the money to go. It was just a way for me to earn a little bit of extra money here and there. So I've had an eBay account since like 2000, 2003. I remember even like years ago ordering <laughs> my prom dress on eBay as a kid and you would have to send in a money order uh, the, the old days of eBay where you would send someone a money order. It's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, I, I was trying to figure out what can I do and I thought maybe I could open up a little resale shop. And I thought, well, worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, I could always get a little part-time job. I could get a little crappy job somewhere. Um, but I knew regardless, I had to get out of my current job situation at the uh, dealership because I just, I would come home just feeling so stressed. I would hate the customers. I would hate how nasty people got with me. Now there were a lot of nice people too, but the, the, the nastiness seemed to outweigh that. So to me it just wasn't worth it and I thought if I stay at this job too, if I continue to stay at this job, they're gonna find an excuse to get rid of me at some point. And I just felt like, okay, if I'm going to leave or not be a part of this company because the people are so nasty, I need to just do it on my own terms and, and plan an escape route. Um, so I, I was looking at uh, office space, I was looking at storefronts for rent, I was looking up info on reselling on eBay, I was looking up stuff about running a store, and at the time they were doing a lot in the state of Ohio to help people wanting to open up a business. And I had some friends who opened up little shops downtown or in the Lakewood area. Um, I'm in Northeast Ohio, Cleveland area. So um, there, for a little while, there was a whole shop small movement and it seemed like there were neighborhoods that were coming back, that people were opening up uh, businesses. And I'm like, well, if they could do it, I could do it. So going back to the friends opening up their own businesses, the YouTube stuff, and me looking up info on my own, doing my own research, I'm like, okay, I could do this. So I set aside a little bit of money, and it, it wasn't really that much, honestly. I want to say it was about two to three grand. That, that's how much I, I put into getting the shop opened up. A lot of business owners might start out with a lot more. A lot of business owners might start with maybe 50 bucks and they just sell online. But at the time, even though I knew I could sell online and I was selling online sometimes, I felt like if I opened up a store and sold online too, maybe that would validate me as a business owner and make it look more professional and you could be part of the community and maybe people could bring things to you that you could buy to resell. Um, and it, at the time, I, I just had this cool, like, dream and wanted to pursue it. And I fell in love with the storefront on um, Madison Avenue in Lakewood because it had these big shop windows. And it was a really old brick building, probably from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it was a little storefront, maybe 800 square feet. Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember the exact footage, but it wasn't a lot. And, but I thought, well, it's just enough, the rent was cheap enough, 
And if I signed a three-year lease, I got a break on the rent where it was like $200 less than it would normally be. And I thought, well, it's a three-year commitment, but the rent was a good deal because um, I thought, well, it's, it's, it's a good start and it's a low rent where I should be good, where I can at least make rent and probably double or triple it. Um, and for the first year I did, like I, I was doing pretty good. Um, and we vend at conventions too, at um, horror conventions, trade shows, uh, comic book conventions. Right now we're not because of the pandemic, but in the past we would. And it was a lot of fun, and sometimes to rent table space for one weekend, it's 250 bucks, sometimes more. And the rent for this storefront really wasn't much more than that. So I thought, okay, that should be all right, because if I can handle a table space at a convention, I could probably handle a little storefront. Um, but with the storefront, okay, so you pay your rent, you have to, you know, make your security deposit, do the application process. And the city, usually, whatever city you may be in, they have a permit, like an occupancy permit. In your state, you have to see about your reseller permit or your vendor's license, whatever they call it. And that's a small fee. And usually you can file for it online. And then on top of that, whatever the lease agreement may be, nine times out of ten, you need insurance for the storefront or the office space you're renting from. And so... To insure it against like a fire or an accident or something like that, it was um, almost a thousand dollars a year. So I had that to do. And then you have like, if you have to pay any utilities, so your electric, water, heat, if you have any utilities that you need to cover. Um, if you have well, a lot of resellers, even if they're just selling online, have a PO box, a post office box. Um, Let's see, a <laughs> cash register, display cases, um, shelves. A lot of the shelves I picked up from Habitat for Humanity or other thrift stores like that, I would look for like cheap um, wooden shelves or display shelves. Sometimes I would like paint them all one color so they would match even though they didn't really match. Um, I went on like Facebook and Craigslist looking for display cases. I had a glass display case. I bought a, a, a little electronic cash register online. I used PayPal uh, for the credit card reader and had everything like hooked up to a phone. So I had like, you know, my shop phone and uh, the credit card reader. And that's, that's another thing too, like your phone and internet. So if you're renting um, a storefront or an office, you have to think about that. You, you're going to have to pay like your internet bill, your phone bill, whether it be a cell phone or a landline. And all of that does add up. But the good thing is you can use that as a write-off for your business. Um, now, of course, for any of that, for any tax advice, go talk to a professional tax advisor. I am not a professional. <laughs> I never claim to be. I'm just someone sharing my business experience. Um, but yeah, I rented the storefront for three years. And it was all in my name. I did it myself. Um, my husband James did help a little bit with um, getting everything set up, moving things into the store, decorating it. Um, we painted a couple of the walls. It had like this crappy carpeted floor. I left it alone because you're renting and, and there's only like so much you could do to renovate it. Plus I didn't know what the flooring was like underneath. Um, but yeah, I loved those those two front windows and then there was like a door in the middle and I loved setting up the, the displays. I would have like weird mannequins in the window, um, horror film stuff. I'd have like a vintage, though the one window I, we hooked up like a vintage TV. What well, was a, a vintage TV cabinet and then it had like a little digital TV in it. So it looked like an old timey TV and we would run monster movies on there or like our videos, the mummy and the monkey videos. And uh, we called it the Mummy and the Monkey's Thrift Crypt. So the shop was labeled Thrift Crypt on the uh, marquee above. That's what, they, that's what they put on there, the Thrift Crypt. And the Facebook page, I, I did take it down this year, but it was called the Mummy and the Monkey's Thrift Crypt. And we would show up at the store in character. We would try to have little in-store events. 
Uh, like we had some local artists that would be there to showcase their work. They would um, make appearances. We would have authors come in and do book signings. So we tried to set it up like a mini convention to try to bring people in. And there were many times where it was successful. I like I want to say the first two years I had some success with it. Where some weekends we did really good in sales. Um, but there were also days where you might only get maybe one person walking through the door. Uh, especially when it was cold outside, like January and it's like 10 degrees and icy. You might get one person walking in the door. Some days you didn't have anyone walking in. And it was in downtown Lakewood. And the parking situation in the city of Lakewood, Ohio, isn't very good. So I think that turned some people off. Um, because they had to park in the streets or park down the side streets. And it seemed like in the summertime, spring and fall we did decent, but then winter it was just dead. And I would put stuff online. I had an eBay store as well. And I would take pictures of stuff to uh, advertise in-store and eBay. A lot of my items I would put like in-store pickup. I would put stuff on Facebook Marketplace to try to like bring some customers in because if they're coming in to pick up uh, an antique camera that they saw, maybe they'll look around the store and find some other stuff they want to buy. So <laughs> that was my whole thing. I would I would pay uh, a little bit here and there for advertising on Facebook. Um, we had some attention from the Lakewood Observer and the Cleveland Scene Magazine. We were mentioned a couple of times in there. Uh, Cleveland Magazine in 2017 and and it's kind of funny because they, we were labeled as um, the best horror themed thrift store well there's no horror themed thrift stores but I, I had it set up like a thrift boutique it wasn't like a regular Goodwill or something it was a small little resale like boutique and I would display everything real nice have it um, I gave it like a real e eclectic look and we would get some customers that uh, maybe they used to live in California, maybe they visited out west, they would tell me, you know, your prices are really good here and your shop is set up like those little shops in California, but everything there would be double in price. Um, so I had some compliments and that, that was nice and I tried to keep the pricing reasonable, but at the same time I needed to make some money. <laughs> it, so it wasn't just set up like a regular junkie thrift store it was more like an experience a boutique and that's what I had in mind and with with these little events and yeah like I said the first two years we did okay but it really like my sales weren't that good I'm gonna be honest like um and at the time my husband James was working full-time and and he, he's, he still works full-time now, but he had a different career situation, and he's like, he was very supportive of it because um, he's that way, and it was, it was something I wanted to pursue. I wanted to give it a try because I thought, well, worst case scenario, I won't renew my lease, and I could work another job. I can make it work. I just knew that I had to get out of where I was before to try something different, to go on to that next step. And the last year I had the shop was 2019. And I had this feeling like I should not renew this lease. Um, sales aren't good this year. Um, and they weren't really super, like I'm not, I wasn't rich. It was like, it was like, it was like, uh, like blue collar wages. <laughs> like worse than maybe like fast food worker wage or something. But at least it was fun. I had a lot of fun with it. I, we had regular customers that would come in. Um, but yeah, uh, fall of 2019 is when I started to try to get rid of stuff from the store. I was not open to the public anymore. Probably by October of 2019, I was trying to like put everything online or put it locally on Facebook. Um, a lot of stuff I gave away, I donated because I thought it's going to take a couple of months to clean the store out and to, to get everything out by the time my lease ended in January of 2020. And I wanted plenty of time to clean up everything and have it good for the next person who rents it. And also to get my security deposit back and, and to be nice to the landlords. So that, that's another story too, I'll tell you that in a minute. 
but yeah, I, I ended up giving a lot of stuff away. <laughs> We're liquidating it, selling it cheaper, um, putting it on eBay, and just being patient if it was something that was more collectible. Um, but it, it was fun for a little bit, and it was just a, a part of, it was just something I had to get out of my system and try. And after doing it, I'm like, no, I'm good. I think if I were to open up a store again, it would be a building that I own. I don't like renting, and I will never rent again. If I were to get have a business location, it would have to be a building that I would own. Because no. I, I did not like renting, and um, I had... So the first year I was there, and I was renting, the place had mice. So originally I thought, well, I could have a coffee, a, a coffee pot in there, I could buy a mini fridge and store some snacks in there so I have something to eat while I work. No. The place had mice running around and they were leaving poops everywhere and chewing on stuff and I had to throw a lot of things out that were in the back room because mice got to it. And it was really gross. So that happened the first year of renting this storefront. And that kind of, it was like, you know, you know. And then the, and then the first winter, there there were issues with not having heat and not having hot water at the in the restroom sink. So it had an old style of the um, oh, what's it called the boiler type of heating, and there were some days I was there and it felt like the heat wasn't on at all. I would put in multiple um, multiple maintenance requests to have the heat fixed and they never fixed it. So I would have to bring a space heater into the store. And then on days when it was just too cold and too unbearable, I would just have to close early. And I would put a sign on the door saying, closed, no heat, sorry. Um, so I had issues with the heat all three years of the lease that I was there. Um, then I had issues with the air conditioner because they had a little like window air conditioner above the door. It was just a really old air conditioner. It wasn't working right and it was leaking water everywhere. And it took them like almost a good six months just to replace that. They, they finally replaced the air conditioner like in the fall or winter. <laughs> it was like so weird. Like they would do the opposite, you know. It took them forever just to just to work on anything. And I just was not really, even though the rent was cheap, I guess I got what I paid for, right? But, you know, basic things like heat and air conditioning are, are pretty important. Um, so that's why I don't want to rent anymore. And the overhead with, with the permits and insuring the place and paying the electric bill and um, all that, I'm like, done. <laughs> I, I guess I didn't really, I took me... Um, owning a storefront for three years to realize that I didn't want a storefront after all. And it's funny how life works that way. But I sell online full time on eBay, Poshmark, and Mercari. And I do have a playlist on this YouTube channel called Monster Hustle. So that talks more about the eBay selling. So I do sell on eBay, Poshmark, and Mercari now from the comfort of my own home <laughs> and no storefront, which I'm, I'm really grateful right now that I don't have a storefront with this whole pandemic stuff. Um, my heart goes out to business owners right now that are struggling. I hope things get better for everybody. And yeah, it's it's gotta be tough. It's gotta be tough. It was tough then, pre-COVID, just me running my own little shop. Sorry, I'm thirsty. But it has to be a lot tougher now. Um, but I am happy for the experience. I'm glad I, I got it out of my system and it's done. Would I do it again? No. No. <laughs> so this isn't very encouraging to people who were watching this hoping they could learn from this and open a storefront. No. If you want to open a storefront or open your own business, go for it. Because worst case, think about the worst case. Like... Okay, worst case scenario, I, I get rid of it and then I do something else. I go get another job or I, 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 or I change my business model to be online. Like you can always change it up later, but at the same time, like I didn't, I, like I lost some money because I, it took me a little bit of money to set up the store. 
I did make some money the first year, or first two years. The last year, you know, um, but I didn't, I wasn't like losing my shirt, you know, I wasn't going bankrupt. I was still able to cover my regular expenses. My husband and I still have a roof over our head. We can still cover stuff. So we're grateful for that. We really are. Um, and yeah, like another thing too with, with running a business and especially if you're female, some people won't take you seriously. They just think, oh, that's cute. She's playing store. Oh, look how cute. Oh, she thinks she can run a business. And I would get guys, well, women and men, who would not take me seriously. They kind of talk down to me a little bit, um, kind of kind of rude with some of them. I had one lady tell me that she had some things she wanted to, re uh, to sell and get out of her house. And I told her that, you know, we're resellers, we buy and sell trade. And, you know, hey, I'd be interested in, in seeing what you have. And she goes, well, let's wait till your husband gets back. I, I'd like to talk to your husband about this. And I told her, well, this shop is in my name. It's technically my store. He's just here to help me a little bit, you know, and keep me company. And we talk to our, our friends that visit in the shop. And No, but yeah, it, it was weird. Like, some people will not take you seriously as a female business owner. And I... We've befriended people who run stores, um, some females who are also business owners, and they have experienced the same thing. Like, I know one person when she has an estate sale, even though she might know about the tools or the lawn mowers or whatever they have in the garage for sale, she will have a guy friend hang out in the garage to answer customer questions because they'll go to the guy before they go to a female. Um, I guess that's just how things are sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, and then the, there were a lot of good customers, but yeah, there were like some, <laughs> I'm kind of babbling now. Um, we had some weirdos come into the store too. Like there was a gentleman who, uh, walked into the store who I found out later was schizophrenic and doesn't, didn't take his meds that day. But I was told that he, he told me that he was Marilyn Monroe and that he's a leprechaun and that he was in the Leprechaun movies, and then he told me that we were in a movie together. <laughs> so, some of that was like, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it was it was just crazy, but, but interesting too. Um, so yeah, all in all, I'm really glad that I've switched to online and it's less overhead. Um, but yeah, if you, even if you want to sell online, if you want to vend at a convention, you can do it. If you want to open up a restaurant, you can do it. Check, check your local, um, check your state laws regarding permits, um, vendor licenses, that sort of thing. See if there's any programs available to help you if you want to start a business and maybe you want to take a class. Maybe you want to talk to someone else who started um, a business to see how they're doing. Uh, I think it was an interesting experience, definitely. And if you guys have any questions out there for me, please let me know. Please put it in the comments below. Um, I've worked with the public for a long time. I've seen it all. I've had, especially working in retail, I've had a lot of weird retail stories, and maybe I could share that in a, in a separate video. But yeah, I worked for as a manager for 10 years and as a regular employee in retail three years so yeah 13 years of working in retail and then three three years running a little shop and um, a full-time eBay seller well yeah since 2017 so three years and I've been on eBay for a while I just wasn't t selling it on there full-time or, or really thought it could be a, a full-time job, you know? So, <laughs> trying to think if there's anything I'm missing from this story. Um, maybe if I forget something, I can add it in. But thank you guys for listening to me babble and tell you this story about how I ran a store, how I ran a shop. And, um, yeah, like, share, subscribe. 
and I'll talk to you soon. Mwah. Bye. Okay, so I did forget. I did blah, forget, forgot, forget. <laughs> okay, so I did forget something. Um, I mentioned that the maintenance and the landlord was, was they were kind of difficult to deal with. The, the, the company that owns the, the building that I was renting from. Like I didn't have heat sometimes, sometimes I didn't have working AC. Uh, they had a mouse and rodent issue in the store, so I couldn't leave food in there. I was afraid to leave stuff in there. Even though you're working all day and you, you hope to pack a lunch or, or have something to drink, you're afraid to leave anything out because of the mice and it was real gross. Um, so I went, so the lease ended in January of 2020, right? And they're supposed to go over everything with you within a month of turning your keys in. They go over it and they're supposed to tell you like if there's anything that needs fixed or if they need to withhold your security deposit. And I never got that. And March rolls around, March of 2020, and I thought, well, I haven't heard back from them. I turned in my keys in January. Let me email them to see when they're going to mail the security deposit. Because I left everything really clean. I took pictures and video of everything. I even left them the uh, old vacuum cleaner that I had. It was still working. I left them a vacuum cleaner like a broom and dust pan. I left some cleaning supplies there for the next person if they wanted it. Um, and they uh, sent me an email back saying, yeah, yeah, we'll get it sent out. A month goes by. So this is April of 2020. I don't hear back from them. Um, I email them saying, hey, when was the security deposit mailed out? I have not received it. I have not cashed it. You could check your records. There's no check that I cashed from you. Uh, when will I get my security deposit back? And they said, oh, it was, it was mailed uh, last week. It's on the way. Th now, this is a company that I live close to where I could have just went to the office and picked up the security deposit. But then this whole plague thing was going on too, and they just said, oh, we'll mail it to you. They, did, they didn't even want me to go pick it up. I'm like, okay. Um, so May rolls around. I email them. They don't email me back. I call them and leave a few messages. They don't call me back. So I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? It's been like five months. So I was doing some research. I went on Facebook asking some friends and I was advised to send them a certified letter giving them a 30 day notice. And if they didn't send me my security deposit back within the 30 days, I can go to small claims court to get my deposit back. So that's what I did. I sent them a security deposit and then, or not sent them a security deposit, I sent them a certified letter asking for my security deposit back and gave them 30 days notice that they had to mail it back. And while that's going on, I'm also gathering up all my receipts from every time I made a payment to rent. Anytime, you know, it showed up in my, um, in my banking, I kept all those records from the three years of every month paying rent on time. Every single month. I paid on time within the first week it was due. And I'm waiting five, six months for my security deposit back. And it wasn't even a big amount. Like the rent wasn't too bad, but it's still the principle of the thing. And with a lot of, um, with this whole pandemic thing, it's like, there's people that need that, you know, there's people that rely, you know, that are wanting their money and, and I was needing my money. Um, so I get a phone call and I think I may have recorded it, so I may or may not include it, but I, I did get a phone call back from one of the landlords. I think there were two or three of them that were the owners of the company and they, uh, he was kind of snarky to me over the phone, kind of like a, being a smart ass to me on the phone. And I, I said, well, look, it's been six months. He, he called me on the 30th day, the 30th day that he was supposed to mail my security deposit back. Otherwise, I was going to go to the small claims court. And he called me saying, oh, it's in the mail. You'll get it this week. And I'm like, I asked if he had a tracking number 
Is there a way I can track it? Did you send it certified? He didn't send it certified. He just mailed it. And I kept checking the mailbox every day to make sure. So I did get that six months later, got the security deposit. Now, uh, in regards to the renter's insurance, I had to renew my renter's insurance last fall. I want to say September, October, that type of range of 2019. I only had a few months left on the lease up until, you know, January 2020. So uh, October, November, December, January, maybe three, four months left. They wanted me to pay a whole year, a whole nother year in advance, and they, they told me that um, they could do a partial refund once your lease is done. They were like, give us a call, we'll send you a partial refund once, once it's all done, but you have to pay the year in advance. So I paid almost a thousand bucks in advance last fall. So they owed, they owed me, it was, you know, it was, it was a good chunk, you know, for part of the year that they owed me, and it took them almost five months to refund that as well. So these companies, they're so fast to take your rent. They're so fast to take your money. But then when it's time for them to pay their part or do their part, uh, so there's some companies that just don't follow best business practices. They're not as professional as they should be. And I'm not saying that all businesses and all landlords do that. Um, but in this case, it took me almost five and six months to get the security deposit back and to get my insurance um, reimbursement back. So when, when you are running, uh, renting a store, when you are trying to do things like that, you have to watch for stuff like that and you have to be really be on it and be consistent and consistently like contact these people and, and saying, hey, look, where's my refund? What's going on? I need updates. And always keep your receipts. I'm not a professional, so don't seek me for professional tax advice, but always keep your receipts. Um, always keep your paperwork. And when you do have a storefront or an office or any registered business, you're going to get a lot of people trying to sell you things too. Like I had a lot of internet and phone companies wanting to come into the store to try to sell me their service. Um, there was some other company trying to sell me their credit card reader, all this other stuff I didn't really need because I already had it set up my own way. And it was just a nuisance. Like, go, go away, salespeople, <laughs> you know. So I had to put a no solicitors sign on the door. And, and they would still walk past the door and not pay attention to the sign and try to sell you stuff. So, yeah, just be weary of that. Be, um, be leery of anything that sounds too good to be true you'll sometimes get emails or phone calls or people sh wanting to sell you something or sell you a service or say it's going to boost your sales when it really won't and and what you're doing may already be a better way to do things or you can find a, a better way to do it without spending so much money so <laughs> you have to remember to, to cut that in um and, and yeah, that, that was my whole experience with, with like, now that that's finally behind me and I got my security deposit back and I'm done with that storefront, I can, you know, that's, that's off my shoulders and it's, it's like, whew, done. <laughs> um, I have some photography friends that are actually renting my same, the storefront I had now, so I hope that they'll be better and uh, they'll have better luck than what I had. So, yeah, like always, thanks guys, thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, comments, you know, put it in the comments below and I'll try to answer the best I can. And uh, that was my experience with being a small shop business owner and uh, with a physical brick and mortar storefront. Ooh, <laughs> take care guys, bye!